All right. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are we doing? Good? Awesome. Well, my name is Davin Entinger, and I lead the seventh grade boys. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, to start off, I have a question for you guys. So, just a show of hands, who here has a job? Simple question. Okay. All right. Keep them, keep them high. Who here has kind of a weird job? Okay, okay, a few of us, a few of us. Who in here just mooches off your parents? It should be all of you guys, really. No. Who in here just steals from their parents? Oh, got you guys. Get them. Get her. Get all of them. No, I'm just kidding. But, so, my reasoning for asking that question is I've had several jobs in the past, and one of my jobs has been working for DoorDash. And one night I was working for DoorDash, and I got this order for this guy named Dave. And Dave ordered from McDonald's. So I go to McDonald's, get the order, and I bring it to the address that he gives me. And it ends up being this, like, assisted living care place, right? So I walk in the front door, and to my right there's this table, and then in front of me there's, like, this hallway, and then to my left there's, like, a diagonal hallway. But I'm looking around, and there's literally no soul to be found. Like, I'm literally the only one in this place, or so I thought. So I'm looking around, and then all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye to my left, I see this really, really old guy in a wheelchair coming down this hallway, rolling at me, but he's probably going 80 miles an hour, and he's flying at me down this hallway. I mean, he is barreling down this hallway, and I don't know what to do. I'm like, why are you doing this to me, Dave? Like, are you Dave? Maybe you're just hangry, right? So I'm standing there with this bag of McDonald's, and I'm just like, I don't know what to do. So then finally, I move out of the way. And then he smashes into this desk, and then he falls over, and then he gets up, and he's standing stiff as a board, staring at me right into my soul, basically, right? So he's staring at me, and then out of nowhere, all of a sudden, this nurse, and I don't know, I don't know if tackled is the right word to use for this situation, but she suplexes this guy, <laughs> destroys this man onto the floor, okay? So he's... He's basically done for. I mean, he's out cold. So she gets up. She looks, at me in the, she looks at me in the eyes. She goes, are you from DoorDash? And for a second, I'm like, hold on. I need to come back to reality because I'm not sure if I am who I am anymore, right? So I come back to reality, and I'm like, yes, I'm from DoorDash. And she goes, oh, that's not my job. And then she just proceeds to walk away as if that man is still not on the floor, out cold, probably unconscious, who is literally drooling on the floor. So, I finally, I have enough, and I literally, this is probably bad, but I set the McDonald's bag down on the floor, and I'm like, okay, I, I had enough, and I just walked out, because I didn't want to further, further escalate the situation. But, my point is in telling that story, is that I think sometimes in our life, stuff just happens, and you kind of feel how I felt when I was holding that bag of McDonald's, just witnessing all of that go down, and we don't know what to do necessarily don't know what to do or how to react, right? Because so much is going on around us, and we can't make sense of it. And a lot of the times, it can seem like a lot of the stuff is pointed directly at us. But most of the time, it isn't even our fault. We get, we get kind of, we get put in kind of a middle of a storm, and we don't really know what to do. So we literally look to anything for safety, now, looking at scripture, I've noticed two types of storms that we can see in our lives even today. So, if you're taking notes, or you can just look up on the screen, but so the two storms we have tonight is an environmental storm and a self-induced storm. So, we're going to be rooting our study tonight in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. You can just have it open and have it ready. We're not going to read through it just quite yet, but I can give you guys a couple seconds. All right. I think we're good. Okay. All right. So, environmental storm, right? Stuff just happens, okay? It's out of our control. Like, let's say... Let's say you go to Starbucks, okay, and you order your, your venti caramel frappuccino with six pumps of vanilla and oat milk because regular milk makes you a little gassy. You get, you get 
you get whipped cream and those cute little chocolate flakes and the caramel drizzle and who in here, who in here, who's that, who's his, whose drink is that? Raise your hand. Whose drink is that? Matt, don't be shy. We all know it's you. Come on, raise it up high. <laughs> no. So instead of getting your 42-ounce Frappuccino, like you ordered, or as I heard the Starbucks down the road calling it, the Matt LeBrot drink, right? <laughs> no, they give you a tall, dark roasted Americano, and I cry myself to sleep. Some people cry themselves to sleep about it. Um, other people, right? Um, or another one could be you're driving down the road and you get a flat tire, right? It just happens. Or maybe it's an unfortunate diagnosis of a family member, right? It's not their fault. They didn't do anything to cause it. It just happened. Or maybe it's, you know, fill in the blank for whatever you're going through. You know what it is. It's not your fault. Again, it just happens. Now, in our main text this evening, the first part is what I would like to call an environmental storm. So, if we can look at our Bibles, we're going to read through verse 22 through 27. All right. So, Verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Now, to give a little bit of a background on this passage, this is right after Jesus had fed the 5,000 with the littlest amount of food, right? Like a Happy Meal's worth of food. This is also during a time what scholars say is the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., right? So the disciples have been up at edit for a long time, rowing and rowing against insanely strong winds and waves. They are exhausted, right? They are absolutely pooped. And not to mention sleep deprived at the same time because it's literally like 4 a.m. in the morning, right? My point is, is that there's so much stuff going on around them and it wasn't their fault. They did nothing to cause the storm going on around them, right? The environment around them caused a storm, environmental storm, but they were trying to get out of it, obviously. They just kept paddling and paddling. And while they're paddling, all of a sudden, Jesus starts walking on the water towards them. There's already so much stuff that is happening, and it doesn't make sense. And nothing that Jesus is doing is making any sense at all either. How many of us have felt how the disciples felt in this situation? How many of us have felt as if you just keep rowing and rowing and rowing, and you are just exhausted, right? You are pooped. And also, nothing you're doing is getting anywhere either. But a lot of the time, it's not even close to being our fault. It just happens. We can see another example of an environmental storm in the story of Job in the Old Testament. Now, Job was an incredible man, right? He loved God, he feared God, and was incredible, incredibly consistent in prayer. But that it's the devil decided to make Job's life absolutely miserable. I mean, the devil did awful, terrible things to Job, and his main goal was to draw Job farther away from his faith and his relationship with the Lord. And he did so by taking his children away from him, his riches, and his livestock. I mean, Job's wife literally told him to curse God and go die to get it over with. But through all that, Job still remained faithful to God. Job did not doubt that God was in control of his life. This is true even for our lives. What we can gain from these stories is that when we are going through a storm, we must remember that God is in control. And this is something that Job clearly understood and acted out while in the midst of a terrible, awful storm. We can see that. When he says in Job chapter 42, verse 1 through 2, he's replying to the Lord. He says, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's a fun word, thwarted. 
we need to remember that when we are in the midst of our storms, when I am in the midst of a, a terrible storm, I need to remember that no matter how hard the winds are and how high the waves are, God is still God. And as we can see in our next point, the storm in your life does not stand a chance against him. This brings us to our last half of the passage in Matthew. So we're going to read verse 28 through 33. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those, were, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now, Peter, in this half of the story, actually highlights our second storm, which is the self-induced storm. In this part of the passage, we can see that Peter is walking on the water towards Jesus, but then becomes distracted by everything going on around him, that he loses sight of Jesus and starts sinking in the water. So it makes me think back to when I was a kid. I was about eight or nine, and I had figured out how to slide lock the garage door shut. And for hours, my mom was trying to figure out why the garage door wasn't opening. And I got scared because I didn't want her to get mad at me, right? So I whispered to my older sister, I was like, I was the one who did it. And she immediately tattled on me, like right away was like, Davin was the one who did it. He just said that he did it. And I was like, you turd, like why would you, why would you do that to me, right? And then after that, I had to watch my entire family eat ice cream in front of me, right? I did that to myself. That was self-induced. I brought that upon myself. In our passage in Matthew, Peter focused completely on the storm and not Jesus, and as a result of that, he gets even more drenched than he already is by causing himself to start sinking in the water. Peter, in this situation, brought this onto himself and brought his own storm into effect, just like I did when I had to watch my family eat their lovely twisty twist cones right in front of me. Now, there's another example of a self-induced storm that we see in the Bible. This is the story of Jonah that we actually just talked about in the bad Bible translator. But I'm sure many of you have heard this story if you grew up going to church or just regularly attended church. But Jonah also very much loved the Lord, just like Job and the disciples. But one day, God asked Jonah to go to this city called Nineveh. But Jonah decided it was a better idea to hop in a boat and try to go as far away as he could to a town called Tarshish. And while he was in the boat, this huge storm hit, and all the passengers eventually decided that it was Jonah's fault that this storm had hit, which was, which was true. So they literally threw Jonah off of the boat per Jonah's request. But after that, Jonah was then swallowed by a fish for three days and three nights, and he spent that time praying. Then God finally told the fish to throw him up onto dry land, right? Jonah brought this onto himself, just like Peter. In both of our stories, we see two men who turn to the power of the wicked people and the severity of the storm around them before turning to a greater help. Peter failed at what we must truly do, right? When we are in the midst of a storm, we cannot focus on the storm itself. Jonah knew he had caused it, so he turned to God, something that Peter failed to do. See, when you are, in a, when, when you are stuck in a sin cycle, don't focus on not doing that sin. Focus on Christ. If we are to remember that God is in control, we do this by focusing on the Savior, not the storm. Now, let's say this. Let's say you're struggling with pornography, right? Don't focus on not looking at those photos or videos on your phone because all you're thinking about are the videos and photos on your phone, right? Focus on Christ, not not doing it. We are called to Christ-likeness. We don't do this by not sinning. We do this by being more like Christ and following in his footsteps. We must, we must have faith in Christ that not only is God more powerful than our storm, but Christ alone is our Savior. He is who we must put our focus on. Now, the thing about faith 
is that it is not only believing that God can stop your storm, but it is also knowing that if he doesn't, he will help you through it. When we see these storms in our lives, we tend to react in two different ways. The first is that we tend to exaggerate the danger and make it seem far worse than we originally think. Right? This is the devil's, one of the devil's greatest tools to exaggerate our danger, right? To, to exaggerate the danger so we think it's far worse than it really is. And I want to challenge you guys in your life to realize the moments that you tend to exaggerate your storm. Now, I have a question for you guys. What do you guys think is the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut? Simple answer, two weeks. That's it, right? Two weeks. Most of you guys' relationships don't even last that long anyways. So you're fine, right? You're fine. So <laughs> the second way, the second way we react to a storm and that it, is that it is truly a real problem, but there is a greater solution and help available. I want to challenge you guys, do you truly believe that? That there is a greater solution and help than what you have been trying. I remember when I was younger, okay, my younger brother was about four or five at the time, and he was convinced one day that he was Superman. So logically, he climbed on the main water pipe in our basement and busted it. So there was water flowing everywhere. I mean, everywhere in the basement. So we tried to get buckets and towels to try to clean it up. And it wasn't until about an hour later, the neighbor came over and was like, well, why don't you just shut off the water on the electric panel? We were like, oh, all right, okay, yeah. Now what we were doing in that situation was helping, but there was a greater solution. Do you guys truly believe that in your storm, there is a greater solution to what you are going through? You don't have to just tough it out like the culture around us is preaching. There is someone greater who wants a relationship with you and who wants to stand by your side when you are going through the lowest of lows and the highest of highs. More than anything else in all of creation, he wants a relationship with you, but he cannot make that decision for you. It is in your hands whether you want to make that choice or not. Now, being someone who's gone through the lowest of lows... I wanted nothing to do with anything related to church or God. Okay, I only wanted to do what I wanted to do and only trusted myself to pull me out of the trench that I had put myself in. I can tell you there is no better time than now to put your faith into Christ. And as I had it completely wrong, you are never too far gone and you are never beyond the love your creator has for you. Okay, we have so many caring and loving leaders in this room who want to help you make that decision if you have not. And if you have, but you've kind of been led astray or kind of strayed your own way, they would love nothing more than to help you realign your life with Christ. So, when you are in the midst of your storm, will you join me in remembering that God is in control by turning to our Savior and Him alone? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity we can come and gather uh, for you, God. And I just, I just really pray for a good time in small group. And uh, yeah, Lord, again, we just thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.